There are various methods available for reductive alkylation of amines or reductive emination of aldehydes and ketones, which basically amount to the same thing, and the most commonly taught one involves the formation of an aminium ion by condensation, which is reduced to the amine by sodium cyanoborohydride. This method has some definite practical advantages in that cyanoborohydride is sufficiently unreactive not to affect the carbonyl compound, but it also has some significant disadvantages. Sodium cyanoborohydride is not cheap or widely available, can contain a significant amount of sodium cyanide as an impurity, and it's relatively hard to homebrew because the process also involves homebrewing sodium cyanide, which is not a task to be taken lightly. Recently, I came across a method published by Hedari and colleagues in 2007 in which a stable intermediate was formed by combining the amine and carbonyl compound in water at neutral pH using guanidine hydrochloride as a catalyst, then reducing it to the amine by adding sodium borohydride. I could scarcely believe how simple this was, so I got some guanidine hydrochloride from eBay I've got several other potential uses for it, and decided to give it a go. Much to my delight, it actually worked. The authors didn't offer any mechanistic explanation for why the reaction works, and subsequent work by other authors seems to indicate that the guanidine works as a catalyst in this reaction and its more advanced relatives, due to its properties as a strong non-nucleophilic base. I tested it out by using formaldehyde to methylate the amine group on gamma amino butyric acid, GABA for short. That's GABA with one B, by the way. Nothing to do with the early uh, 90s hardcore rate of music. Since the methylated product is a lot less soluble than the starting material and provides a good indication of whether or not the reaction has actually worked. And generally speaking, the quaternary ammonium and carboxylate salts of N-methylated amino acids, respectively formed below pH 4 and above pH 9, are much less soluble than the acid itself, which is also a good way to identify them. The reagents used were GABA, 5.15 grams of that, guanidine hydrochloride, 0.25 grams of that, 37% formalin solution, which was 9 grams into equal portions. Sodium borohydride, which is 4.2 grams into equal portions. 37% hydrochloric acid, 6 milliliters into equal portions. Industrial methylated spirits, 200 milliliters of that. Deionized water. 120 milliliters in portions of 50 and 70 milliliters and acetone. Guanidine, hydrochloride and GABA were dissolved in 50 milliliters of water and then 200 milliliters of methylated spirits were added to the mixture followed by the first portion of formalin. The intermediate takes 10 to 15 minutes to form fully. After this, the first portion of sodium borohydride was added, causing a lot of effervescence and little heating. In the original paper, water was used as the only solvent, but I found an alcohol water mixture worked better, as this caused the borohydride reduction to complete more quickly and more cleanly. The reaction was also less exothermic than it was with water alone. The addition of borohydride and the subsequent reaction caused the pH to rise to about 9, and big coarse lumps of insoluble salt precipitated out. The mixture was stirred for 30 minutes, after which the pH was adjusted to around some weight concentrated hydrochloric acid, about 3 milliliters in total. The second portion of formalin was added, and the mixture was again stirred for 15 minutes. I think in retrospect I should have added the borohydride more slowly at this stage. Also I should really have given more time for the insoluble salt to dissolve after the acid was added. 
The second portion of sodium borohydride was added, and much as before, there was a great deal of effervescence, a little heat, and a lot of precipitation. This was much finer than the first precipitate. Again, the mixture was stirred for 30 minutes and adjusted to pH of them with concentrated hydrochloric acid, about 3 milliliters in total. The mixture was then heated to boiling point using a crude kind of reflux setup and sufficient water was added to dissolve the fine solids. It was about 70 ml in total. At this point I noticed that some of the coarse insoluble precipitate from the first reduction had been carried over all the way to this point without dissolving so I carried out a hot filtration to remove it, transferred as much of the fine precipitate to the filter as I could Added a little more water at the boiling point to re-dissolve it, then cooled it overnight in the fridge. As the final product is not very soluble in either water or alcohol, it precipitates out very promptly and it was recovered by vacuum filtration as small coarse plates. Needs a wash with bastone to remove any drained water. The final yield of gamma nn dimethyl aminobutyric acid, or GANDABA, was disappointing, but I'll reveal the exact fix of shame after a brief diversion. Now, apart from the obvious difference in solubility, how could I be sure this alleged GANDABA was the real thing? As a simple test, a sample from a previous run was partially covered with a watch glass for nearly a week and was otherwise open to the air. Unlike the starter material, it was not at all hydroscopic. A more rigorous test involved dissolving a small sample of the product in water with sodium nitrite, cooling the solution to fridge temperature, then adding hydrochloric acid to form nitrous acid. No reaction occurred, indicating that either the tertiary amine had been formed or it had isolated something that is completely unintended. In this test, primary amines decompose and release nitrogen gas, secondary amines form N nitrosamines, which separate as an oily transverse liquid, and tertiary amines do nothing at all. The final yield was 2.87 grams, which was 44% with respect to GABA, which was not at all impressive given that I got 78% when I tried it at a smaller scale. I've since identified the most likely causes for low yield, adding borohydra too quickly at the first step, which caused big lumps of insoluble product to form, not waiting for said lumps to dissolve with acid before adding the second portion of formaldehyde, and, as a knock-on effect, using too much water during the recrystallization due to the insoluble material still being present and fooling me into thinking there was more undissolved product present than there actually was. Still, it's a useful learning point for next time. For relatively simple compounds like soluble and alcohols, this is potentially a very useful method. The intermediate, whatever it is, appears to be more stable and less prone to hydrolysis than the aluminium ion, and no exotic agents are required. It could potentially run it at all with larger, less solid compounds, though adding DMSO as a co-solvent would likely help there. And if there are existing ketones or aldehydes in the target molecule, they need to be protected, as they would be indiscriminately reduced by borohydride, not to mention the uncertainty about which one would react with the amine. The authors also claimed a very similar method reduces alpha-beta unsaturated aldehydes and ketones to alcohols without affecting the double bonds, but I've not tested that. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.